I'm Daniel Jordan, park manager of Highbridge Trail State Park. Um, all right, so um, I've been in parks for almost 27 years. Wow. So I started when I was 14. And so I've always um, had a, just a love for the outdoors, uh, bring, you know, going up and scouting, but also um, I was a kid that you get home from school, you drop your bag and you're in the woods until the street lights come on. And so, uh, so I've always just loved being outside and, and that sense of adventure and, and you know, exploring the wild. And so, um, so when I was 14, um, I was about to enter high school and uh, parks have this problem at, at the end of summer. And the problem is their, their wage staff goes back to college mm -hmm. or they go back to school. And so there's a void. And so when I was 14, I was able to get a chance to, to start working at Aquan Regional Park in Northern Virginia. And, uh, and so there was, it was you know, maintenance, mowing grass, working concession stands and stuff. I started at $4.90 an hour. And back then, minimum wage was four twenty-five, and so um, that was pretty decent money for a fourteen-year-old. And so, uh, even if the uh, the school system could never get my work permit correct, but uh, but no, it was it was good. So I ended up working in that seasonal position at Aquan Regional Park for eight years. So I worked um, all through high school and then through college. So. Um, but then it put me, um, by doing that, it put me on a track to, I went and got an associate's degree in Parks and Rec. I ended up getting a bachelor's in recreation management. And, uh, and so uh, I remember coming home and I had a 4.0 that semester and I, I did what any good child would do and I put that, that uh, report card on the refrigerator where it belonged. <laughs> and so, uh, so my, uh, my parents were like, it's not rocket science. It's, Parks and Rec, <laughs> but uh, but no, I, I I enjoyed it and I enjoyed um, just the mechanics of learning the ins and outs of how a, a park becomes a business. And so um, so I ended up when I got out of college, I you know I'd worked for um, the Marine Corps doing uh, military recreation, and then I uh, decided to, I did that in Japan, and so uh, I came back stateside and um, decided that I wanted to be back in the U.S. so I could get married. Um, now. She had no idea, the young lady I was coming back to pursue, she didn't have the same plan, um, but we're about to celebrate 17 years of marriage. <laughs> so it worked out. Um, but so I came back and I, I went, so I worked for Northern Virginia Regional Parks for eight years as a seasonal, and I, I came back and worked two years as a full-time. And then uh, our uh, house got sold out from underneath us in Fairfax, in Northern Virginia, uh, back during the housing boom. And so uh, my brother, called me and said, hey, why don't you move to Alabama and help us restart a church? And I was like, okay, you know, and so I, I packed up my new bride and we, we, went, we went to Alabama and, and, um, and it was good. And so I ended up getting a job with Alabama State Parks. So I worked down there for a number of years. And then I got a phone call that Virginia was hiring. And so I ended up on the Eastern shore with Virginia State Parks in 2008. Um, at Kipter Peak State Park and so I worked there till 2015 as a chief ranger and assistant manager and then I in, ended up um, being got promoted in 2015 to Highbridge Trail that's how we that's how we ended up here yeah so and you've been so this is your fifth sixth year yeah so we're um, so um, October will be my sixth it'll be my full sixth year and um, and I love Highbridge I love the the community in and around Farmville and um, uh, I just, um, I have 62 miles of neighbors right now. And, uh, and actually, we, uh, we have about 60, uh, 64 miles now with uh, moving into to Pamplin. Um, but it's, it's, it's such a good park and it, um, it's been a challenge. You know, in my, in my career in parks, um, I've worked in everything you can think of, a full, full service, um, campgrounds, cabins, day use, beaches, mountains, um, you, you know, you name it. I'd never worked at a, um, such a historical park with um, any ties to Civil War and Civil Rights, but also I'd never worked at a Rails or Trail. And so coming here, is, it's rounded out my career in, in parks. So it's been, it's been really enjoyable. You mentioned you love it here. We certainly love having you here. It's I part, appreciate part, it. part of the community. And, and yeah, I enjoy High Bridge myself. I've yeah. done, run many a mile on, on High Bridge. <laughs> And it's, it's lovely, and, and I think y'all are redoing the bridge. We are redoing the bridge. So um, right now, the uh, the bridge is being redecked, and so uh, just over the years, the the lumber has deteriorated to a point that 
we made the decision and we were able to uh, acquire the funding to fix it. So um, the, the whole 2,422 feet is being redecked, um, stringers decking everything. And so um, right now um, we are, so into the March, uh, it started January 18th and they have uh, stripped all the old lumber off. Um, they've laid all the new stringers and now they're about a third across of, with new decking. And so, uh, so we are, you know, looking to to May for it to be done, and we can reopen. And and um, it's you know, it's it's the gym, it's the jewel of the trail. And I hate that we had to close it. Um, it's a necessary part of maintenance, and uh, you know, to, per, to to protect people and and to maintain the integrity of the bridge. And so, um, luckily, it hit in the winter, and uh, and so we'll uh, we'll we're working as quick as possible to get it back up. Yeah. So by the time it's warm, people can go out. Then go out and enjoy it and, and see some fireflies hopefully this year with the restrictions being lifted. So, um, uh, but yeah, so we have that. And, uh, and then the other thing right next to it is we're getting close to opening a, a visitor center. So um, the COVID has pushed pricing up. So we've, we're having to rebid it, uh, but hopefully we can break ground the next year or so. And that will be down near the bridge, but it'll be a, a place that people can go to connect with park staff and, and right now we, you know, our office is five miles from the trail. And, and so we, um, we're desperately wanting to be on the trail and being accessible to people. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. Um, and this might not make it, but is it still going to be, is it just a special type of wood that y'all use on the bridge? Or? So it's a, it's a ground contact pressure treated lumber. Okay. Um, and so what we've done is um, we actually special ordered everything. And so it's a, it's a much higher treatment level than what you would buy off the shelf. And we did that just to, to give us that, that extra mile so that we can um, have a, a sustainable product that will, will last for years and years. So, um, but yeah. Those are questions that, that people like me think about. And it's just like, I wonder how long each of the planks last. And this yeah. Well, it, it's funny. Um, when I was doing my research uh, and working with our uh, project manager with trying to figure out what lumber to use and you know and all these acronyms of MCCA and CCA I mean just you name it and so um, a lot of the literature online it it takes you to the Northwest well the Northwest a little bit different climate the different trees and uh, different processes and so um, a gentleman from a, a lumber preserver came here um, and just on his own to look at it he's in Virginia and, and he's like I'm boring you with with lumber facts and and me and one of my uh, employees were like no this is great it was like yeah. tractor beam in you know learning about wood specs yeah. um but it's it was it's good to know like you know how the the chemicals work in it and preserve it and and just you know moisture content ratios and uh, it was just again um the i guess a little bit of my nerd coming out but it was it's but i'm with you i, I do agree that it's uh these things is like, well, wait a minute, how does that work? Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, so we're, we are, um, we are using a much higher grade lumber to, to deck it, yeah. Well, I look forward to it being finished. You and me both, <laughs> so. So, park manager, is your title, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what does that entail? What does a, a normal day look like, and do you have a normal day? I, I think as, uh, as abnormal as it can be is our normal, um, so, uh, Craig Guthrie is a chief ranger, been here for years, and he has a saying that, you know, sometimes you have plans for the day and sometimes the day has plans for you. And I feel like we live in the latter. It's, you know, it's one of those things that um, I, I have very productive days and I haven't gotten a thing accomplished on my list. And so, um, so uh, you know, with being a park manager, um, we, uh, well, my, my position and the other park managers of the state, we, uh, we oversee all operations of the park. And that includes the admin, um, the hiring, the, the budget, uh, the law enforcement, the maintenance, the outdoor education, uh, I mean, everything. And so um, it's, it is a multifaceted job. It's uh, very dynamic. And it's, what I enjoy about it is there's no day that is the same, that there is a lot of different components that come into it that one day we may have you know more special events and it's all the things leading up to it other days you know we have the education piece um, and there's always the the budget and the admin that hangs over me and and um, and so it's uh, and I enjoy crunching those numbers and and figuring out what we can do to 
to make the park better and make it more accessible, making it so that we have programs and you know, the equipment necessary to, to make it so that it's here for the community. And so, um, it, you know, and I'm very, um, I very much enjoy hands-on and, um, you know, as I mentioned, 27 years, I, I started swinging a weed eater when I was 14 and um, I still enjoy doing those things and it's, um, you know, that mower therapy that you can get out and either mow grass or, you know, do whatever have you. Um, just to, to be connected to what we do. Um, unfortunately, as you, as you move in um, and move up, you know, the desk commands more of your time. Right. And, uh, and so, um, but I still get to be outside and, and I really enjoy that. But yeah, there's no typical day. Um, and, you know, there's a misnomer with day use parks, which Highbridge is the day use park that, you know, they're, they're quiet and they're slow. Um, and we're anything but and it's and I'm glad that we we have the draw um, to the community and I've always said that Highbridge Trail is good for Farmville and the community and the community in Farmville are good for the trail and we we work to to be um, in community with one another and, and work together and so um, you know it's it is it's good um, and it just it means that there's more opportunities for us to connect and um, and how I look at High Bridge is it's a rail line that the residents of Farmville in the 18, late 1840s, 1850s, they petitioned Southside Railroad to move the rail from the, the south of town to come through town. And, um, and what it essentially did is it connected Farmville to the rest of the world um, for goods and services. And it was a game changer. Um, and so, uh, you know, as the years have gone on and, you know, the Beltline came in and it, you know, basically bypassed Farmville, well, we have a, a line that isn't, you know, suitable much for the railroad because it's expense, expensive to maintain that bridge. And so here it is donated to the state, to the, the public trust. And, and so you have something that was built to, to connect the community for goods and services and now it connects the community for recreation. And so it's, um, it, it's something that I take great joy in that we do have a 31 miles of trail. We do have a large 2,422 foot bridge. Um, and you know, and with the, the struggles and the challenges with the pandemic, it's wonderful that, that the park was here, that we have 31 miles of social distancing. And, um, and so people rediscovered the outdoors. They, they, they were able to, um, or even sometimes just discover the outdoors. And, um, and I love when we can, when we can um, entice a child with a program or something and we get them hooked on the outdoors, on programs, and they will drag their parents to every, every part of a park. And so, and it's, and it's this wonderful opportunity for families to reconnect, for for them to to enjoy out the outdoors, and these simple things as a gravel trail through the woods, and you stop and you hear the you hear the birds. Um, you know, we we have a black snake that loves to hang out at one spot. He doesn't bother anybody, but you can find him just about every day at the same time. And, you know, and it's like you know, so the 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 park gets a personality. You know, and you stop, and it's just like amazing diverse ecosystem of things so it's uh it's really enjoyable to be a part of that and and um and with my job it you know it it takes me to different parts of the park to different communities to to see those things so. wow that that's amazing i mean you you speak about this place like we talked about Milton, and that's awesome and it's a it is a truly neighboring community and there's yeah. overlap so much between Milton and highbridge i mean same with Creek twins lake like oh it's just the history is just so. Yeah. Anyways, I'm gonna cut this. My family yeah. out. But. Yeah, you're good. No, you leave it in. <laughs> <laughs> but you just, yeah, you speak yeah. very, very amazingly about the high bridge and its place in the community. I think we, the community would echo your sentiment. Yeah. By, by far. I, took, I take my daughter there for the first time, and in this pandemic, really, our little COVID bubble, we go out and she's looking off the bridge and it's like, oh, the view, and or we go to the bottom part and look up at the bridge, and yeah. it's like, wow, you know, and the light and the water. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it, and the, the bridge is amazing on top, and I, I don't want to take anything from that. But going underneath and the majesty of it, yeah. it's it blows you away. Yeah. And um, and then not only that, the, and the bridge is amazing. 
but when you get on the east end and there's the, the, the berms, the embankments that have been built up, that was all hand and mule work. And it's like, how in the world did this get built and, you know, and stay? Um, and, um, and, and so, and even on the east end, my favorite part of the park is the, Mo, the Moran rock cut. There's this granite rock face that they blew through and, and it's just, uh, you know, there's some real uncommon rare plants there. Um, that, you know, we had a botanist come in and he's like, do you know what I discovered? And I was like, I'm guessing it was green, you know? And so, um, but it was neat to go and look and see these, see that like again, these diverse and these rare um, communities. Uh, and so it's, it's, it really is, is something. Um, the other thing is something you just said about the community. So somebody once asked me if I was bothered when private businesses use the name Highbridge in their name. Because there's hybrid photography, hybrid lodge and cabins, hybrid lofts, um, you know, uh, hybrid productions, you name it. Are you kidding me? I love it. I love the notoriety that people think, one, so much of it that they're going to use the name in it. But also the, the whole idea that um, when somebody looks up hybrid, they'll find the trail, but they also find private businesses or vice versa. And uh, we're, you know, we're good for one another. And so it's, um, so I am so happy that people think so much of the park and the community, they want to use it. And so, um, so it's, it is, that's one of those indirect, um, un, you know, unintended consequences of it. And so I'm, I'm glad that, that we have it. So. Yeah, that's something I never would have even thought about unless you just said it. So that's, that's super interesting. <laughs> yeah. But that, yeah, it does make sense. You know, mutually beneficial. Yeah, oh, absolutely. People have to reach and five hours to come up and mm -hmm. come to the state park when they would never otherwise. Yeah. Um, so, what are some things, just maybe about the hybrid itself or maybe about other state parks in general, like that maybe people don't know about that you think that they, they should or that people might find interesting? Um, so, something that we talked about is one, Prince Edward County does have the most state parks out of any county. Um, and so we have um, Highbridge, obviously. Um, now Highbridge does run through, is in Nottoway, Prince Edward, Cumberland, uh, and now Appomattox with us uh, purchasing um, Appomattox, uh, the, the last mile into Pamplin. But, um, but we also have Twin Lakes um, and we have Sailors Creek. And so, you know, um, and then on top of that, we have the Farmville Five. So we have within 30 minutes of downtown Farmville, you have five state parks. You have High Bridge, you have Sailors Creek, Twin Lakes, Bear Creek Lake, and Holiday Lake. And so we've, we've dubbed ourselves the Farmville Five um, for that reason. And, um, but there's so much history in our parks. Um, and <clears throat> so, you know, we really do have um, so much to offer, I think, um, you know, with history, with, you know, with biology, with the outdoors, um, with riding a bike. So there's a lot of different, um, things that we can hit on to you know to people's liking if they want to geocache if they want to run a race or hike um, but you know getting into what's around here you know you have um, a lot of history and so um, you know we always say that Farmville is where the Civil War meets civil rights but you have Sailors Creek which was on Lee's retreat so that was on April 6 1865 the Battle of High Bridge is April 7th, 1865. Lee surrenders two days later in, uh, in Appomattox. Um, and then you also have Twin Lakes, which was a segregated park. It was Goodwin Recreation Area and Prince Edward Lake for Negroes. And, uh, you know, it's this time in life, which was, you know, such a, such a difficult time, a family is denied entrance to Stanton River. And they're like, time out. What about separate but equal? And so the, uh, the General Assembly uh, allocated $195,000 um, to, to build a state park in Prince Edward County. And so uh, in 1949, that was done. In 1950, it opened. And, um, and so that, the, the park itself, um, it wasn't called a park. It was called the lake. You probably heard that before. Are you going to the lake? And so um, there's just amazing history down there. And, though, and so in the park has done a really nice job of, <clears throat> of incorporating that because now it's Twin Lakes. They've incorporated um, those into, into the two parks into one and, and, um, and have done a nice job 
um, you know, making day use and overnight facilities and stuff like that. And, and, um, but here again, that was the only segregated park in Virginia. And so people might not know that. And here we are in Prince Edward County and there's this immense history. Um, right next to Twin Lakes, you also have Galleon State Forest, which was the first state forest. There was a, geo, uh, a POW camp for Germans there. So, I mean, you know, good, bad, ugly, and different, there's a lot of history in this area. Um, and, and I think that Virginia State Parks in whole does a really nice job finding those stories. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not the most rosy of what they, they make up our character of who we are today. And they, we are in this spot in history because of those. And so, um, so making sure that we don't forget those stories. And it's, I mean, some of our parks were CCC parks with uh, the, um, in the 30s. Um, some were, you know, just donated or, you know, whatever have you. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's a whole mix and myriad of, of how we do things, um, which, it, you know, I think that speaks to the partnerships and the, you know, sometimes it's just the, the conversations or, you know, somebody has the means and the desire to, you know, in the right conversation to push on the through and it becomes a park. Um, and so we see this across the state, but there's something special about Prince Edward um, and the fact that we do have three parks, more than any county in the state. Um, and so how, <clears throat> how do we, we work together? And so the, you know, Farmville Five, we work together, but the trio, you know, if you come to Twin Lakes to camp, we want you to come see Sailors Creek and we want you to see Highbridge as far as a park setting. And some people might not know that this piece of history is so close. And so, um, so it's one of those things that wanting to make sure that, that we do tell the entirety of the story. And so, uh, and so the hope is that parks really do play a role in that, um, in that piece. So. And to speak to partnerships, I mean, you better believe when folks are coming to vote, and like, what else are they doing in Farmville? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> Hold on. I went to Farmville 5. I didn't know that actually before, so that's, I mean, I knew of Holiday Nick, and I, you know, yeah. I worked at a school, Bear Creek Academy, which yeah. is right up the hill, you know, right up yeah. the hill from Bear Creek State Park. But yeah, I hadn't thought about it. I'm like, yeah, 30 minutes, you could get, you know, that's, yeah. that's a big useful for us. But we're like, okay, go, you know, go run on Hoppers, run a bike, go right on down, then go on to Rice, go to Sales Creek. Yeah. You know, Go up to Twins Lake while you're down there anyway. Come back to town, stay in the wine though, come eat a little yeah. more up, like absolutely. Uh, make a weekend though. Yeah. Well and, and that's the thing. And um and if you come to if you're camping or staying in a cabin at Twin Lakes, like I I want you to know, hey, you know what, Bear Creek, mm -hmm. you know, you can knock out five parks and see um see some really cool things in a short amount of time. Um, and, and I think people want to know that. They want to know what options they have in order to do it. But also, you know, it's, like you said, you know, and I appreciate the partnership with Moton because, you know, you'll push people to us and it's like, hey, have you all, have you all gone to town? Have you gone to the Moton Museum? Have you, have you gone down and done the, the Civil Rights Walk? Or have you done Lee's Retreat? You know, these things that um, there's some really good history. And people come in here and they're like, I never even heard of Farmville, right. and wow! I mean, there is it's a, a complex little town, right. and um, and so uh, we have a little bit of everything, and so um, and you know, I and I think it just speaks to the fact that you know your size in a community or whatever can still have a big impact Absolutely. on what on on history, and and so um, and and we have that. So so we are charged, folks like you and I are charged with carrying that on and telling that story and, um, and finding out more. Um, Sailors Creek had a gentleman, Chris Calkins, that was the manager, and he was an avid reader. Um, he's since retired, but, you know, he dug through diaries and, you know, all these things and, and found out a piece of the story that we had no idea. Um, we had um, glass negatives go up for sale online on eBay that one of our um, volunteers purchased. And, you know, we got pictures of hybrids being built in 1914 when they redid the bridge, which it, it filled in some of the gaps of the story. Sure. And in the pictures really illuminated what happened. So, you know, we are always looking for answers. I'm sure that you all have people come in and 
I went to school here. Yeah. And, you know, and so it's like, well, let me talk to you. Right. Um, because those connections, mm -hmm. and we, we get a piece of these stories that, um, that are sometimes forgotten or lost or you know, just not carried forth. And, and it, it connects us to the past so much more. And the same with parks is how do we connect? And how do we connect people to those, those stories? So our history is our history. You, we can't change it. And, um, I, you know, and I, I know that some of what we, we experience and see in, in our past makes us squirm. And, um, or we don't really like, oh, we weren't that bad or whatever have you. Um, but, you know, High Bridge Trail, I mean, it was a railroad. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's stories on here um, that I think we need to tell. And, and, um, and so, um, you and I have talked about the Elam bus accident. Um, what a tragedy that a bus was hit and, and five students were killed. So um, with what you and I have been working on is redoing the, the sign of Elam. And, um, and so the, the sign, the information is good, but there's just the silhouettes of representing the children that were, were killed in the, the tragic bus accident. So I would love to, to get that actual pictures of the, the students just because they're people. They're like, you know, they were sons and daughters, they're brothers and sisters, they're friends. And so, um, like, let's remember their memory up there. And so, um, and, and just, in the sign is, is a wonderful um, informational point of, like, this isn't just a simple road crossing, but people lost their life here. And so, like, in, in this part of the story of Prince Edward County and in, in the trials and tribulation that we're facing the community. And so, how, you know, again, let's, you know, here's just another piece of it. And so, um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you all. I, you know, I think this is, um, this is one good story that, um, I mean, a, a story that is worthwhile telling. Um, don't want to mix my, my words and what I'm meaning. Um, but this is something that needs to be told. And so, and as we, as we dig through history, what other things do we find out? Um, you know, um, Tuggle, you know, a little blip in the road, a, a crossing, um, there was a gentleman, John Grubb, that was killed in 1906 there. And um, so John Grubb was murdered. Um, he was a uh, immigrant from England. He was on the second wave of immigration after the American Civil War. And, um, and so he, um, he had lost his leg in a train accident. He had a cast iron prosthetic leg, rusted off on the ship over. And so he gets to Virginia and he, he ends up being the postmaster and the general store manager in Tuggle. And back in, in the 1800s, the early 1900s, there were just a couple things in Tuggle. Um, and, uh, and this kind of goes with, like, here's a, you know, Elam is, a, is an impactful story. Tuggle also, which is nothing there now, they had the, uh, the Tuggle tank to fill the trains, the tank school, uh, which was the school named after the tank, and then they had this little general store. And so 1906, John Grubb is murdered and the building is burned. And so, um, you know, the police have no, no leads, nothing. Well, a gentleman was imprisoned in an emporia. He, he um, uh, you know, confesses to the murder in his sleep. And his, his cellmate reports it. And so he's interviewed and, and he, he is, mur he did murder um, John Grubb. So he is sentenced to, to hang in Farmville in 1907. And uh, so when they go and do it, the first rope breaks. So they put him back on the, shack, the scaffold with another rope, that one breaks. And um, it, this sounds like a really bad joke. Um, you know, but the, the third rope, he's, he's hung and, and is killed. Now, it's a little macabre story. However, Tuggle and the murder of John Grubb at that time, it, they went away from gallows and hanging people for a public execution in, in the state of Virginia, in the Commonwealth. And so it, they standardized execution. Um, again, not the most rosy part of history, but that happened on what is now Highbridge Trail. And so we have these, and, and we have some wonderful 
you know, points in history. And, um, you know, you think of the train station in Farmville coming in and it's this very ornate, elaborate, you know, train station that was built that way because of the all-girls school, the, the teaching school that became Longwood, they, they dressed it up. You know, so, you, and you have uh, the men that were shipped off to war from that train station. Uh, you know, so there's, there is this connection to history. And again, I, you know, good, bad, and different. There's been some wonderful things that have happened on that rail line and have carried people to and fro. Uh, and there's some hard things too. And so the way I look at it is my position in the community is to tell those stories um, and, uh, and then frame it in a way that is accurate, um, that it gives a picture of who we are, of where this little town of Farmville and this community of Prince Edward County, like where we fit in history. And, and the decisions and the things that have been made, and I mean, this is across the U.S., obviously, but how does it matter here? And what are the things that have made it of impact, and um, indirectly and or directly and indirectly? And so, um, so I'm just I'm thankful that we have that opportunity to tell the stories, and I'm thankful that we have 31 miles at this juncture. We seem to have 33, um, 32, but we're able to have the different segments. We, you know, we have the bridge and we have these long stretches of um, dif different ecosystems and these old little towns. And then we have, I call it the urban interface from Main Street to Lancer Park Bridge, Buffalo Creek Bridge. We have this, this part that's in an urban setting, that's in a downtown setting that is not like most parks. And so, um, you know, how does that cater to the students and people just going for a walk during lunch or walking from their apartment down to get a bite to eat. And in that, what, is, what are the stories of, you know, the tobacco prizeries and stuff that the trains came through and were loaded up? Uh, you know, so there's all these, these pieces and it gets pretty intricate. Yeah. Um, and so, and also what what stories do we spend more time telling and you know um and which and i think we as historians we as people we look at you know well this might be a better known story but it had less of a significance in in the scheme of things where this thing is kind of obscure but it, it had a big impact on what happened or it changed our thinking or the way we did business because you know something small was a chain reaction to that first domino falling for it to, to make a big impact. And so, um, so it's, you know, again, um, we don't want to forget Edom. We don't want to forget Tuggle, our Pamplin, you know? And so um, it's, it's a great joy that we get to, that we're handed this history and we handle it with care. And we, we honor the people that were affected, that were lost in it, so. Absolutely. Being good stewards of the history of gaming, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's important, yeah. Absolutely. So I've learned a bunch myself. Um, this turned out bad. I already knew this was going to be great, but it turned, yeah. out, it turned out better than even I would have been. Well, I appreciate it, and, and, and I agree. It's, and it's, um, it's funny because um, me at the Parker Youth of Moton, like, this becomes our, our life and our work, and, and we live this story. And it's funny because the first time you hear it, it's like, you know, that dump truck backing up and just dumping is like, you know, so much information. Right. But then through the, the study and the retelling, it, you know, it just becomes the, you know, the story that we, that we have engraved on, on our, our minds of, of telling. And so, um, and it's, I love learning the new, the new points that it's like, oh, you know, guess, guess what I just read or just found out. And so, um, and how it plays, plays that role. So it's, it's enjoyable. So, for me, I, mean, I, I knew I wanted the interview series, you know, second season or whatever we're going to call this eventually, to like be, you know, focus on some more parts of the history and kind of make some connections. And like, I was at a pre presentation on Israel Hill and Appomattox, and yeah. so they started talking about kind of the free blacks back then, you know, and, and they looked for employment. And so a lot of them got to build hybrids, and I was like, well, you know, so that took it through this war, which took it, like the connections between, like, it's a timeline, it's a very fluid timeline, mm -hmm. in terms of like. Uh, uh, you know, Israel Hill to Sailor's Creek to uh, High Bridge to or flip those to 
um, Twins Lake, you know, Prince Edward State Park for Negroes, to Moe, like it's all like... All connected, uh, yeah. We need to write a book. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, the... A volume. Of... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, um, and it's, it's something I, I just thought about when you said that. So we have a, we found a cemetery at, at Camp Paradise near the bridge. We don't know much about the cemetery. And so we're trying to work through and figure out like what kind of cemetery it is. Mm. And there's about 67 graves in it. There's only one marked grave. And it's a gentleman named Henry Jeter. Mm. And he was hit by a train in 1906 and killed. Um, we know that he was African-American. He was prominent in the community. I mean, he, he's at the end of the, so it's, that cemetery was um, in the 1800s. Um, his grave is towards the, towards the edge of it, so it's probably one of the last ones. Uh, he's only a marked grave. Um, his family is in the Moton line. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we're trying to learn. We don't think that it's a slave cemetery. Right. Um, but we don't know right. what, you know, and so it's, you know, we become detectives of history of trying to find out these, these pieces. And so, um, and we know there's children in there because there's some very short graves. Mm -hmm. um, so was there a polio outbreak? Was it workers from the bridge, you know? And we know that there was, we know that the first bridge, there, there was slave labor on it. There was also Irish um, that were out there. So they had different, um, different segments. So could it be that there's no, um, but there's no big plantations or anything, no big farms necessary right there. Um, that, Part of Prince Edward County was pretty depressed back at that time. Um, so again, we're, we're, we're going through trying to find that, that connection. But again, here's somebody in the mountain line right. that is, you know, buried out there. Um, we had historic resources come out and look at everything and, and, um, and you know, how do, we, how do we proceed? And we're working with um, Longwood's uh, archaeology department and stuff. But, you know, we're not too far removed yeah. that you know, dig into the community. It might be, oh, my, my great grandfather, you know, something. Right. And these kind of oral histories mm -hmm. that, that get passed along. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, not a problem. Kind of the close. Yeah. On a, on a, on a fun, you personal kind of yeah. thing. What are some state national parks that you've always wanted to visit, but just maybe never got around to just yet? So I, uh, I have yet to go to the Grand Canyon. Hmm. And, uh, and so, um, uh, and it's funny because in recreation, we talk about two types of recreation, especially for people like myself that work in it, that we have comprehensive recreation. So say that I work in a park, but when I, when I recreate, I do something completely different. Like, you know, go surfing or whatever. And then you have spillover. And spillover is you do the same thing that you do at work. And, um, and you know, so I very much fall into spillover recreation. And, and, and it's one of those things that um, working in parks, I love it. And, um, and just, there's not 40 hour work weeks, it's much more, but it's, it is just enjoyable. And so, um, so two weeks ago, um, we went, um, I surprised my wife, we went to Florida, we, and we explored the Everglades. I'd never been to the Everglades National Park, and it was wonderful. And so that was definitely on the bucket list. Uh, but as far as national parks I haven't been to, I would love to take my family out to the Grand Canyon and see that massive hole in the ground. Um, you know, and I, I lived out in New Mexico, so I, I've been able to see Painted Desert and Petrified Forest, but yeah, seeing some of those big, iconic, giant of parks. I would love to do that. Um, but on the other side, there's a lot of state parks in, in her, you know, intertwined in between that have some wonderful resources um, and really have a more intimate feel that maybe be a little bit less known. Um, but yeah, I'd love to explore a little bit more out west and, and see, see those, uh, those parks. So, Perfect. yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much. We're doing this. Yeah, not a problem. Thank, thank you for the invitation. I um, I enjoy it, and, and uh, it's good to it's good to connect and talk. So always a pleasure. But yeah, thank you. Thank you.